hard. Yes. Okay. All right, welcome. You're listening yes. to Petroleum 101 on Kaito Radio, where we discuss the latest developments in Guyana's oil and gas sector. Mm -hmm. um, on tonight's program, um, we are going to have an activist, Mr. Ramon Gaskin, on the show. So, folks who are listening, um, Mr. Gaskin was actually the first guest that I had to open my show when Petroleum 101 started on, um, in 2019, so I'm really happy to have him back. Mr. Gaskin, why don't you go ahead and say hi to our viewers and listeners? Well, good evening um, to you and to Kaicho Radio listeners. I'm glad to be on your show this evening and to share my opinion with you and your listeners. Okay, thank you very much for coming on. Let's get right into it. Um, recently, we've had quite a lot of developments when it comes to advocacy for the renegotiation of the Stabrook Block deal. And last year, you had shared a lot of views about how you thought that we needed a whole new deal. And recently, we've had persons advocating for the Payara production license to be held against ExxonMobil um, as leverage or as a bargaining chip to make them come to the table. But mm -hmm. on the other side of the table, we had the argument from the Vice President, Mr. Barry Jagdio, that right now the coronavirus pandemic has virtually weakened so many industries, including the oil sector, where oil companies have had to sell out um, their assets in order to keep cash flowing so that they can focus on their most important investments. And for Guyana, Guyana has so far been safe from any sort of selling out because Guyana has crude that is um, very easy to produce and it's enviable in the world. So the argument from the vice president was that Payara could not have been used as a bargaining chip because we should be grateful to ExxonMobil and its partners for cleaving to Guyana and for investing in Guyana. Um, what are your views on whether Payara should have been used as a bargaining chip to renegotiate the Exxon deal? Well, first of all, I don't think it is the policy of the government, of the, this government or the previous one, to renegotiate the deal. Mm -hmm. They all seem to be happy with the deal. Yes. Uh, we have to remember that, and not... We don't talk about this a lot. This first deal was done in 1999 yes. with Janet Jagan as president. We forget that all the time. She signed that first agreement as Minister of Petroleum. And that agreement was kept secret for 17 years. And only in 2016 we got to know about it. That's the first agreement where Mr. Trotman, of course, and uh, negotiated the second agreement. But we must not forget that this giveaway of the Resources of Guyana started in 1999 with Janet Jagan as president. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. So we have this present uh, production sharing agreement with Mr. Trotman signed. We have to remember also, and we forget it all the time. This is a production sharing agreement. This is not profit sharing. It's production sharing. You, there's production going on. And we get some of it, and they get some of it. We're getting now about 14 about 14 barrels out of every 100 that comes up, and they get 86. That's what the deal is about. They get 14, they get 86. And that 14 includes the 2% royalty. That's the second thing to, to remember. Most people would say this is a very unfair deal, but that's what it is. Besides that, ExxonMobil and their partners do not pay any taxes in this country. They don't pay income taxes, corporate taxes, capital gains taxes, the VAT, and none of that. And duty-free, they get a lot of concessions worth billions and billions of dollars. On top of all of that, the agreement provides for us to reimburse um, SO, which is a subsidiary of ExxonMobil, for the pre-contract cost, which I understand has already reached about 946 million U.S. So this is a bad deal. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is you're not going to get 
uh, act on to renegotiate the deal so easily. They know, they know, there's no reason for them to do so. They have a very good deal. They pay 2% and they take 86 and give us 14 out of every 100. They're not going to do it. Um, they talk a lot about something called the sanctity of contracts and they, they're quite happy with it. And the gov this government also seems to be quite happy with it and the previous government. So that's what you're at. You don't want to get no renegotiation so easily. Now, Payara. There is a view that Payara, uh, the, the licensing for Payara was held up and we had an opportunity to renegotiate. Uh, that's the word people use a lot. Um, it did not happen because the government does not, it's not part of government policy to renegotiate nothing. This government, now the previous government. So we have Payara and the, the people have gotten the license now to do Payara. I think they got it on the 30th. It is my opinion from reading the press and from observing everything that this Payara license, which was held up for some time, I think, from the EPA side, uh, would have been given to them. I said that eventually. And, and, the, um, and the vice president made it clear that uh, he would give it to them. And it's, it's not the end of the road. And they have opportunities coming ahead that would give us a chance to renegotiate or look at it one more time. So they got the payara. They got, they got the deal. So that's what they got. Is, so, in your view, Mr. Gatskin, um, is there anything that would cause Exxon and its partners to come to the table at this time and say, we are prepared to um, renegotiate this deal in good faith? It is, it is my considered opinion, having looked at it and studied it carefully and discussed it with legal people, that the, the production sharing agreement is flawed in law, but aside the fact that it is unfair, it is flawed in the law. It is illegal. Many parts of the production sharing agreement are not consonant with the laws of Guyana, including the Petroleum Act. And it is my conviction that if a court were to strike it down, strike down those clauses that are not consistent with the laws of Guyana, they will be forced to the table to come and redo those clauses. The, the production sharing agreement is flawed. It is illegal in many regards. I'm not talking about fairness and the 2% royalty and all of that. I'm talking about illegality. It is illegal in many respects. I think about 8, in 10, eight to 10 various parts of the production agreement could be successfully challenged in court. I really do believe that. And if such a uh, challenge were to be successful, then so would be forced to come to the table to have the, those uh, parts of the agreement done over, uh, reformulated. Uh -huh. Only that. But besides that, you ain't going to get them to come to the table. They're, they're not interested, and the government itself not interested. But a court could force them to come. Mm -hmm. In your yes. view, Mr. Gaskin, um, how difficult would it be to bring such a, a review um, into place? I remember at one point you were talking about the need for a judicial review for this contract. Yes, yes, yes. And you were talking about getting involved with a movement that could challenge this contract in court. What yes. came of that? Well, I talked to the law. We still want to challenge it. It's been held by the COVID. You know, the courts, the courts are not working the way they used to work. They work at part time. They're closed. Uh, but I, I still think the only way to bring about a renegotiation of those illegal, the illegal parts of the contract is is uh, by going to court to challenge it. The unfair parts of it, the royalty and all of that. I guess if if the court were to strike down some parts of the production sharing agreement, you may be able to to get an improvement. In, in the uh, in the terms and conditions of, of the production sharing altogether, which is very unfair. Besides being un illegal, it's very unfair to the people of this country. We are being exploited, uh, resources, and the people of this country are being exploited by this production sharing agreement they have with with ESO. Clearly, clearly.
And if you looked at it, if you look at it, uh, I know Kaichou has been reviewing it consistently. Uh, and if you compare it with, with um, production sharing agreements that are held by other countries all over the world, you will see that we, our deal is not a good deal. It's a very bad deal. It's an unfair deal. But that's what you got. That's what you got. And everybody happy with it. Extra happy is the government is happy. This government and the previous government. Uh-huh. And, and that's what. Kaicho keeps campaigning every day for, for improvement and renegotiation and all of that. The opposition is silent. The government is silent. We have some new parties that came up recently. They are all silent. They don't have a word to say about any of these things. And, and, and that's what you got. That's what you got. Like, we're virtually helpless in the face of this unfairness and this illegality. That, that's what you got here. But I'm still hopeful that um, they can, when the courts are functioning properly, uh, they can go to the court and, and have it reviewed judicially. The legal aspects of it, or the illegal aspects of it. Mm-hmm. It's a bad deal. Um, it is a bad deal. What has happened um, over the years is that there seems to not be enough political will um, with our leaders on either side of the table to get this contract renegotiated. Would you Do you think that the public... Um, far and wide wants to see this contract changed. Um, recently we had the chair of the private sector commission, Mr. Nicholas Boyer, on here uh-huh. on Petroleum 101. And one of the things he suggested was that there could be a referendum on whether this deal should be negotiated. And when the results do come out, he says, uh-huh. Uh-huh. the government shouldn't... Um, resist, it cannot resist the will of the people. If the people say it, they want the deal renegotiated, then the government yeah, but has it, to try. It, it, it doesn't depend on the government alone. The mm-hmm. government is only is one of the two signatories to this agreement. Mm-hmm. You, you cannot change the terms of this agreement unless the other party agrees to the change. Right. The only way you could have a change to this agreement, in my opinion, is if a court will strike it down. But unless, in the absence of a court striking it down, and the other party doesn't want to come to the table, there's no way you could force them to come to the table. I don't know of any way you could force them to come to the table, uh, you having signed this deal with them. Mm-hmm. And you know the principle in law, the factors from Servando principle, about the sanctity of contract. And the people say, we have a signed contract, what is it you want to change now? We want to stay with what they've signed. So a referendum wouldn't change that, because if you had a referendum and the people of Guyana say we want a better deal, we want 5% for us, or 10%, that would not bring Exxon to the table. Exxon will say we have a deal for 2%. And of course, Exxon is backed by very powerful people. I think the United States government supports Exxon um, Mobile, which is one of the big American companies. And uh, we'll run up against that too. We have to look at that too. Uh, we see recently, and it is my opinion, that when the American embassy and the, the other foreign secretary down here, Mr. Pong, they get involved in things, uh, they could, they could, um, things could happen. Things could happen, including Payara, including Payara. Payara was delayed, and, and I'm, I'm sure it must have come up in conversations with the people, and they, they got the license. You, you, go, you run up against an American company here, um, unilaterally, you are likely to run into problems with the uh, with the United States people. Clearly, it's clear. We see the problem in Venezuela, where the Chavez government and Maduro government had interfered with the Exxon um, Exxon holdings over there, and they are suffering as a result of all of that, from the embargo and the sanctions and all of that. It's not easy. And Exxon knows all of that, that they're not going to come to no table to renegotiate nothing at the present time. But they will only, they will have to do it if the court strikes it down. And the court could only strike it down if it's illegal, not if it's unfair. The courts do not deal with the question of fairness. The court could only deal with the question of illegality. And, and the, the present agreement contradicts the laws of Guyana in many respects. Dealing with local content and all kinds, relinquishment of relinquishment of blocks and all of that. Uh, there are many areas there where the, the, the production sharing agreement is not consonant to the laws of Guyana. 
Okay. I'm still hoping that we could go to court one day and have the judges look at it and pronounce upon it. My, that's my wish. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, let's move a little to regulation. In your view, how prepared is the regulatory infrastructure in place right now to manage the operations of oil companies and their subcontractors out there? No, they're not. They're not. There's no infrastructure in place. Um, there's nothing at all in place here, as far as I can tell. Uh, did this thing... Forget about the 1999 agreement. So we have the, the present agreement with Trotman. Since that was signed, um, nothing has been done. No legislation has been passed. The present legislation we have, we have two pieces of legislation, uh, the Petroleum Act and, and, the, and the, the other one is called Petroleum Act. I think it's 6504 of the laws of Guyana. They're very old-fashioned pieces of legislation going all the way back to 86 or something. And... Um, for the last couple of years, no new legislation has been passed to, to strengthen anything. So I don't think there, there's, any, um, there's any wish on the part of the government. We're not seeing it to, to get tough, to get strict, to, to better enforce the rules at, at all. The, the, the EPA was trying at one time to be much more diligent in carrying out their duties, um, but we see... Dr. Adams, I think he's gone from there, and I don't know who's doing that now, but it doesn't appear to me that the people who are, who have replaced Dr. Adams are pursuing the matter with the same uh, efficiency as he has displayed. So there's nothing there um, to, to, to tell us. We don't know what's going on out there. What's going on out there? Anybody knows? We don't have people out there to monitor what's going on. Who can tell me what's going on? What are they producing and shipping and, and all of that? Nobody knows anything, That's right. as far as I'm aware. The new government that came in in August, they've had quite mm -hmm. a lot to say about this regulatory infrastructure that is not in place. And they seem to have kicked off with quite a speed. What would you say about the new government's approach? They haven't kicked off Island? with no speed. They, they, well, they've, they've created... Um, I think one committee headed by um, Mr. Nocta, right. which includes two Trinidadians to deal with local content. Um, um, for years, the Granger government never looked at it. The fact of the matter is that the, the law, the present Petroleum Act requires that before you can get a license to do the oil, you have to satisfy the minister about your plans for local content. It's a requirement of the law. The, the HES and the SONM did not do it, and they got a license. For Payara, we go through the same thing again. They have not satisfied, I think Christopher Ram wrote about it this week. Mm -hmm. they, they have not satisfied the minister about their plans on local, gov local content. And therefore, they should not have been given the license. It's as clear as the, the law is clear. It said the minister must be satisfied before he gives you the license. They didn't, they didn't satisfy the minister, and they got the license. And now we have this committee with eight people with some trainees in there looking at it. it it's all uh, cosmetic. It's not serious. They're not, it's not serious. They should not, never have gotten the prior license either because they did not satisfy. And this local constant thing is a very important thing. That is why it's even in the old legislation about, about training, hiring of staff, and procurement of goods and services. I think Kaicho had a big picture this week of an Exxon moving through the, uh, the streets of Georgetown, a whole big fabricated thing about 40 feet long that could have been fabricated here. We're not getting the jobs that we ought to be getting out of it, and that is why local content is put into the act. That is why it's put there and they're not complying with the requirements of the Act. The, the, those requirements should have been presented to the minister before the granting of the license. They didn't do it, and they still didn't do it again on Payara. And we, keep, we have the, the committee with Nocta and all of them, but I don't know what they're doing. They're, they're not doing anything, in my opinion. And the EPA, they, they, they've, uh, they're not as, shall we say, efficient as they used to be. We don't hear much about them. 
I think Adams himself has gone away from the country because he realized he ain't getting no place. So there's nothing in place really to, to, to really, um, and the audit, the audit of all these pre-contract costs, that is taken some time. I don't know when that will start, when that will finish. This is a funny country, a funny agreement, where you come here to invest, and then these poor people of Guyana have to reimburse you for your pre-contract costs. Could you imagine that? You, you're a big investor, one of the richest companies in the whole world, and you have all these pre-contract costs, hundreds of millions, and the people of Guyana have to reimburse you. For, for you to sign something to that, um, I think anybody signing that would have, would have really qualified for admission to, to the Barbies Asylum. Why, why would the poor people of this country have to reimburse Exxon? Hundreds of millions of dollars to pre-contract. And, and then on top of it, say you don't have to pay taxes on your profit. And on top of it, we give you concessions on VAT and all of that. And on top of that, we, we, take, we take 14 out of every 100 barrels and give you 86. I mean, this thing is terrible. It's terrible whenever you look at it. It's terrible. And, and Kaichor alone has been waging this struggle to uh, inform people and to educate them of, of this, this deal. But, but we notice, and not only Kaichor has noticed it, I have noticed it. The opposition doesn't say anything about it. This present government doesn't say anything. And these new parties that came up recently, the TNM and the citizens, this and that, they have nothing to say too. They've all fallen silent. I don't know what is it about. What is it about Exxon that, that they don't want to, to, to speak? I don't know. But none of them wants to speak about it. None of them. I think Mangal was willing to speak. Uh, Melinda Janke was willing to point out uh, some problems there on the environmental thing. And we have a case in court on the environmental permit there, which is an appeal to Kingston. But these parties don't want to speak about it at all. None of them. None of them. No. It's, it's very difficult to get them to speak. Okay. And they, they, the, minister of, uh, the minister of oil and gas, who is the vice president, really, um, he, he doesn't take a strong position on anything. He doesn't. He doesn't. And I'm sure he was involved in the 1999 thing with, with Janet and Sam Hines in those days when they gave away the entire thing to Exxon. Of course, since Exxon had gotten it in 1999, this, this present agreement with Trotman Sign is with SO, uh, Sinuk, Nexon, and Hess because, because SO, which is Exxon, sold the controlling interest in the thing to, to Sinuk and Hess. Right. 55% they sold, they relinquished the majority control of this thing. And uh, they call it in the trade, they call it in farming in. This is the word they use, farming in. They got nothing to do with farming. It's an outright sale of the majority control of the stopper block to Sinuk and Hess for a lot of money. A lot of money. You're talking about hundreds of millions in US. You're talking big, big bucks. And I have an opinion that, that that sale should attract capital gains tax. I don't know if you know, when I was a teenager, I used to work at the income tax department many years ago, mm -hmm. 1961, and I'm familiar with some of the, uh, some of the tax acts. And I don't see the, the production sharing agreement gives them tax-free status on the sale, on the outright sale of the majority control of the project. I don't see that. And the, 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 people, the people at the GRA should look into that. That's my, that's my opinion, of course. They sold it. They sold it. The same thing we see with Kai, Kanchi and Kaichor. They, they got the thing and they sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars. I know your people talked about billions. It could be billions. And, and, and SO, which is Exxon, they have 35% of the Kaichor and they got 35% of the Kanchi. They got everything. There's nothing out there left. I think there's one deep sea, ultra deep it's called, one ultra deep um, thing out there that nobody applied for yet. That's but, Black um, Sea. They, yeah, they, 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 they call that the ultra, ultra deep. At one time, Phillips was interested in it. Some gentleman called Phillips hmm. was interested in it. I don't know how he could do it. He's not an oil man. But um, Exxon is a, a big... Um, partner in Kaichor 
and Kanji, 35%, and they're going to be the operators. So that's a very big problem. They got everything out there. They got everything out there. Okay. My own view is that, my own view is when you read all the material and you read everything, and this whole question about uh, the American helping us with the patrolling of the, uh, of the seas outside there, the Atlantic, uh, uh, the big drugs and all that. It has a lot to do with protecting um, extra interests out there, more than anything else, more than anything else, if you, if you really study it carefully. Because we don't know, look where we are. We don't know what, what is going out out there. We don't have any facilities that could actually go there and see anything. So, we were at a loss. We were, we were really at a loss to know what's going on with this place. And now we're told there's some money that came in from, from uh, the, the first sale of something and is deposited in some special account, I think in the United States, a couple hundred million U.S. or whatever. Yes. And this account, I was trying to inquire from the Bank of Guyana, it's not earning interest. I don't know if the governor could, could shed any light, light on that. What interest are we getting on all this money sitting in the United States? Are we paying interest on all our loans? And we have a lot of money sitting down there that's not earning anything for us. One of these days, you must ask the governor about that. What are we getting in interest from the money we have sitting in the United States? Besides the reserves, we're talking about this Exxon money that sits in some special account. Some special account. We're getting nothing out of it. We're earning nothing out of it. But we're paying interest on the loans we take all the time. The, the whole thing sounds crazy to me, to use a simple word. It sounds crazy to me. Uh, all right, let me you ask all, you a yeah. question that yeah. we have on our Facebook Live from uh -huh. a woman named Karen Smith. Karen uh -huh. Smith wants to know, how would you remedy the situation that you mentioned with regard to the Act? And I believe she's talking about the Petroleum but, Act. I would mention, I would remedy it by going to the Supreme Court. So mm -hmm. Go to the Chief Justice for Judicial Review and to show where this thing is illegal and ask the court to rule on it. I don't see the people coming to the table voluntarily. I don't even see the government asking them to come. But if we could get the court to strike it down, they will have to come. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I've looked at this thing. I've studied this thing for a long time. If the court could strike it down, it is illegal in many regards. And if the court would strike it down, they will have to come to the table to reformulate the agreement in those areas. Because it is illegal. We talk about a simple thing like um, content, local content, they, don't, they did not present to the minister the plan for local content before getting the, the license. And we have re they have repeated that again with Payara. It is illegal in our law. And we have in the law here the Production Act, the, the Petroleum Act, about relinquishment of blocks. The relinquishment has not taken place. Would you and say the whole that, question that, of extension... Um... You, can, you only have six years to extend the thing after you get it for four years. Mm -hmm. There's four years expiration, and the law only allows you two, three-year periods of extension. That's 10 years in all. These guys have been out there since 1999. They're 21 years, you know, and the, the petroleum access 10. 10 is the maximum, after which you walk. In other words, you go home. They're out there since 1999, 21 years. 21 years. Uh -huh. And what do you view the infraction that you just mentioned about the local content plan uh -huh. as grounds yeah. to nullify one of these? Um, and the prior license, yeah, because the prior license is granted without, without uh, SO satisfying the requirements for, for the license. Uh -huh. Absolutely, absolutely. The law requires it. The law requires it, local content. And on training, and on procurement of goods and services, it has not been done. Incidentally, that whole Payara license should be published in the newspaper so everybody could read it and see what it says. There's too much secrecy about all these things. The 1999 agreement was kept secret for 17 years. Mm -hmm. 17 years. And there's too much secrecy about all these things. This is, this is the people's business, and the, the Petroleum Act says that all the oil in Guyana is vested in the state. All the oil belongs to the people of this country. So there's nothing to be secret about. 
It's another private company. All the oil in Guyana are now there, belong to the people of this country. The petroleum access that. Uh-huh. Okay, what I'm going to do and now... And there's too much, too much secrecy. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pose two more questions to you from our uh-huh. viewers, and then we're okay. going to go on a short break. Okay. Um, Karen Smith wants to know, who, in your view, could best represent Guyana in such a court case? Well, we have... You mean from the legal profession? Yes. We have to have... We have to get lawyers who who, who, who agree with what we're saying. Mm-hmm. Who, who, who would um, who would be motivated and who would prosecute the case very seriously? Whereas if we could get good lawyers, we could win it. We could win it. Uh huh. And secondly, we know that both major parties do not want to see the Starbuck Block Agreement renegotiated. Uh-huh. Why do you believe that is so? That with all the advocacy for the renegotiation, neither of them want to budge. Because they're, they're politically connected to the, to the United States, um, ideologically, politically, and since this is an American company, that is what informs their behavior. That is what informs their behavior. They don't want to upset the United States, and that is why they'll go along with it. They don't want to upset them. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much for that answer. We're going to go for a brief um, break, and then we'll be back in just a moment. Okay. All right, now we are back on Kaito Radio's Petroleum 101. I am your host, Kimal King, and tonight we're talking with Mr. Ramon Gaskin about the most recent developments in the oil and gas sector. Now, Mr. Gaskin, I'd like to take the conversation to the Kanji and Kaito blocks. Um, recently, Kaito News has been providing extensive coverage about the Kanji and Kaito blocks and has been seeking to determine what really happened with these blocks. When you um, sign away a block, and blocks that are as lucrative as, say, the Kanji and the Kaitra blocks, which are in proximity to the Starbrook block, which ExxonMobil has been so lucky to have found oil in, um, what yeah. countries have done, they have earned hundreds of millions of dollars um, for the sale of the rights to develop those blocks. And in the case of Guyana, these blocks were signed away for free. So there's yeah. been a lot of controversy about what happened with those blocks and why Guyana could not have gotten something from it. What are the... Do you believe there are red flags attached to the signing away of these blocks? And in your view, what are they? Red is a very mild way of putting it. This, this thing is a corrupt transaction. These are corrupt transactions. Uh, they happened just a couple of days before the elections. Um, those blocks should never have been granted to anybody a couple of days before the national elections to begin with. And, and I think that uh, the, the former president, Ramatha, and the former minister, Prasad, should answer uh, as to what really happened and who were the people, who were the real people that got this thing and what are the terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and I really do believe that the matter is of such importance to this country and the losses we have suffered as a result of this improper way of doing business that we ought to bring in um, forensic people, 
um, from I at my I have a strong preference for Scotland Yard. I don't know if you know them. Bad boys out of London to, to come and investigate this matter and prosecute all those who are, who, who are guilty of uh, malpractice and corrupt practices. All of them. All of them. We, we need serious investiga investigators and forensic people. I have a strong preference for Scotland Yard. I'm a Scotland Yard supporter. And, and, and to find out, get the, 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 the facts about it. And then the thing has been sold, uh, sold to Exxon. And I think GHI there and still in there, the, the Israeli company. Yes. And the ratio company, some other people. And now we see some other obscure names coming forward from Guyana. The, the, and and the, the registration of all these things in secret locations outside of Guyana. The, this thing needs to be properly, properly investigated. Properly investigated by, by, um, by people who know how to investigate matters of this nature. This Kaicho and Kanji. Block. In my opinion, they're corrupt transactions. Not just red flag. They're corrupt transactions to, to take place on the eve of the election. And the, the people who who know a lot about it should come forward and disclose what they know, or they should be um, interrogated in in a in a appropriate police setting to to say what they know. And if they're guilty, they ought to be prosecuted. They ought to be prosecuted for what they've done. It, 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 uh, that's my opinion. We, know, need, we need proper people to do that work. One of the views that's been expressed is that as Guyana's laws uh, are so outdated and its regulatory infrastructure is so weak, what has happened with the Kanji and Kaitro blocks, despite it, um, the fact that it could cause more controversy in another country that, say, has a more developed infrastructure, um, a lot of people say, Oh, what happened with the Kanji and Kaitro blocks, it, it was above board in that what happened was legal. These companies received the blocks legally and they um, sold out stakes in them legally. No, no, they, not, they didn't receive it legally. I just told you, in order to get a legal, to, to get a license for legal block, you got to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You got to satisfy the minister about a lot of things, including local content and all kind of things. You got to satisfy the minister about your financial strength and all of that. It ain't so easy. All of that was not done. All of that, they're, they're, they're in breach of the law. They're in breach of the law and um, the Petroleum Act, although it's outdated, they're still in breach of it and a lot of it has to do with, with criminal conduct. Criminal conduct. Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt in my mind, we have enough laws here to, to prosecute those who are guilty of corruption. Uh, practices in this country, clearly. So is it your view that, as you've expressed, that the Stavro Block Agreement could be brought under judicial review, the same should happen for the Kanji and Kaitra Blocks? Yeah, but the, 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 the Stavro, uh, the, the production sharing agreement, that has been published and we can read it and we can see the flaws and all of that. This, and, and, um, this has went on with the Kaitra and Kanji, that, that's a real horse of a different color. Mm -hmm. this, this is real bad news. This is real bad news. We're not seeing any documentation here on what happened really, who got it, who paid for it, who sold it, who bought it, how much they paid for it, how much Exxon paid for it, 35% that they got on both of these blocks. We, we don't have the facts at all. We don't have the facts at all on, on the Kaicho and, and Kanji block. And in, it is, it is a corrupt transactions and criminal. And we have enough laws here to prosecute people uh, once you get it, gather the evidence. In order to gather the evidence, you need professional people. Hmm. How do you advise the new government moves forward? This new out? government ain't interested. The problem is that this new government ain't interested in looking at what um, former President Ramatar and former minister presided a couple of days before the last election. This new government is not interested in stirring up the, stirring that up. They ain't interested. Why do you know. say that? Well, first of all, it, it, it's their own people. It's their own um, party people. And they, they're, not going to, um, they're not going to open any investigation into what uh, Ramatar and Robert Prasad did. They're not going to do it. They don't, they don't operate like that. The PP does not operate like that. Uh, in the... In the in the simple language, them is their people. 
they are investigate them. They are investigate from a Taran Prasad. The, the, uh, the vice president brought back Robert Prasad from where he was and made him foreign secretary. You know, and investigate him. Quite happy with him and made him foreign secretary. So, Ramatara didn't get nothing yet, from what I can see. I don't think he's going to get me and Rohi. But everybody else gets in. Everybody else gets in. Rohi and Ramatara are still in uh, Jango, <laughs> bad books, I think, for the time being. So, Robert has been brought back and, and given big position. Okay, absolutely. Now, thanks for that. I'm going to ask you finally. Um, with the state of the oil sector in Guyana right now, what should be the priority areas for a government who is managing Guyana's oil sector? The, the, the first thing the government has to be has to make up its mind that it really wants to be serious about managing the thing. Mm -hmm. And if they are serious about managing the thing, I don't think they're serious about it. But let's assume they did the, decide we want to be managing serious about managing the thing. They, they have to deal with. Um, legislation, new legislation to tighten this whole thing and to avoid us having uh, these kinds of illegal and unfair deals in future. And this whole nonsense where we have to pay back a man his pre-investment cost. In which part of the world the, 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 a foreign investor comes to invest in, in, in a project and the poor people of this country got to pay him back. He, he has no risk then. He has no risk. This is all ridiculous. And all uh, that whole model of the production sharing agreement has to be scrapped and abolished, in my opinion. And we should get a straight joint venture agreement with the foreign people. And they must pay taxes, pay taxes when they make profit, and pay a minimum of 10% of the royalty. And, and, and stop all this nonsense that's going on that is ripping off our country and robbing our people uh, of our resources. And they have to get here. But I don't see it. They're because ideologically, politically, they're very closely aligned with the, with the, think the American people and they don't, want, they don't want to interfere with those people. And besides that, the, the, this government here owes the Americans a favor for the help that the American government gave them in helping to push out Granger when he didn't want to go home with the sanctions. And, and therefore, this government is unlikely to want to, to really go after the American companies. Very unlikely. They owe the Americans a big favor. Were well, it not for the sanctions and the second set of sanctions and uh, the potential for a third set of sanctions in danger, we would not have gone. And that they owes them uh, a favor, and he's not going to go after the Americans. As a matter of fact, this government is going to be very pro-American, very pro-American. And we we see it in their policy making. The, 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 the policy that they're pursuing now is like United Force policy, when you look at it. If you look at the United Force Manifesto for Peter de Gaulle, and you see what these guys talking about the private sector and the PP and private public partnership and all this stuff, it's the United Force thing they're talking about. It's got nothing to do with PPP, it's got nothing to do with Jaiban, it's got nothing to do with uh, historical PPP policy. Similarly, in the, in the PNC, what they're talking about has nothing to do historically with anything progressive that Barnum ever had in the PNC. So bo both of them... Both of them have gone astray since they lost the leadership of Bonham and Jalen, both of these big parties. And we're in big trouble as a result. Clearly, clearly, absolutely, absolutely. All right, now, Mr. Kaskin, um, thank you for your answer. And that has brought us to just about the end of our show. Good. I want to say thank you very much for coming on, uh -huh. especially since I asked you to come on on such short notice. Uh -huh. um, I hope to have you again on, and before we go, I'm going to allow you to say anything you'd like to say to our viewers just before you go. Well, well uh, what we, we need to, to educate ourselves about what's going on with, with this industry here, um, I, I think the in our fairness to Kaicho, they have been, Kaicho knew they have been trying to educate our people on, 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 uh, on this thing, how we're being, we're being ripped off, to put it in simple language. And um, we, have, we have to keep pressing the politicians to take a position. But I, I'm not very optimistic. I'm not very optimistic that they'll do it. They'll do it because they're committed to the, to the American position and to working with the American government. They're not going to do it. But this, this doesn't mean that um, you couldn't really, 
you can't really do other things. One of which, of course, is to approach the court, and one of which is to, to demand that we have a proper forensic investigation into Kaichu and Kanji and to see who, who were responsible for criminal misconduct, if there was, and have them uh, made accountable for their behavior. It's as simple as that. We cannot continue how we're going. We cannot continue how we're going. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, oh, you're welcome. Listeners oh, yeah. and viewers, um, that's it for tonight. I hope you can join me next week on Tuesday at 8.30. And every other week as we discuss the latest developments in the oil and gas sector. I'm your host, Kimal King, and you are watching or listening to Kaicho Radio's Petroleum 101 on 99.1 or 99.5 FM. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.